Welcome back. You're watching Biz Check Live from Broadcasting House. And now we want to have a conversation around uh, uh, fertilizer consumption and, of course, upscaling SMEs in the country and uh, ensuring that we encourage more young people to join agri business. Uh, we're joined by Subashini Chand, uh, Chandran. He's the vice, she's the vice president uh, of social impact at Yara Africa. Thank you very much indeed, Subashini for finding time to be with us here. Thank you. Um, so why is it very important that, um, you know, we encourage more young people uh, to join agribusiness? Um, great question and very, very sort of uh, relevant for Kenya today. Um, I think maybe I, I take a step back to share some data which might be familiar to many people, but it's probably good to remind ourselves, O'Brien, that um, we're a young country. Kenya is a young country. Mm -hmm. So 75% of the population is under 35. Yeah. And um, 40 to 50% of that population is engaged in agriculture one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily by choice, yeah. but that's where the jobs are in the informal economy. So if we don't find ways to improve incomes within that sector, I think it's going to be very hard for us to address the unemployment problem and decent jobs for, for youth. And we see agribusiness as an aspirational, positive step that can attract young people. Today, young people don't necessarily think of farming as cool, as viable. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's looking to come to the city and do other jobs. The problem with that is, as an economy, we're growing. We've grown tremendously over the last 30 years, but we're still growing. And not growing at the pace that young people need jobs. But in agriculture, we can find it. So therefore, um, from where we sit as Yara, as a business in this country, that really is, is betting on the growth of this country, we think that um, agribusiness can be a very, very good way to attract young people to be more entrepreneurial mm -hmm. rather than go look for salaried jobs. You know, have the courage to branch out, do your own thing, and be able to make a viable income and serve the market, which is really farmers. That's 50% of of uh, the population here engaged. So if you can serve them and make money out of that mm -hmm. and be vibrant, you're contributing to the country's growth, you have a career and job prospects, um, and it works for everyone. So we think it's, um, it's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, Subhashini, um, you know, the average age, and this is something that has been talked about, the average age of a Kenyan farmer is, um, is 65. I mean, that is a person who is almost retiring, or if they have not retired yet. And so, if not enough measures are to put in place right now, Kenya is likely to get in a serious food crisis, actually a bigger one that, than, than the one that we are in now. And so, uh, the future of farming, the future of agriculture is in the hands of young people. And so, what kind of a framework should we lay down to ensure that more young people are attracted to agriculture? Yeah. So there's, there's some recent data, and this is very nuanced, so I'll put a caveat there, that says uh, the average Kenyan farmer um, is not so young. You have 64. That's a data point we've heard a lot in, in many of the multilateral databases. And, but your country is young. And therefore, those young people who are in rural areas, who are not employed in urban areas, are also in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So though the head of the household, the owner of the land might be 64, young people are farming. So what is the average age of, of the Kenyan farmer is, is a question that's now come back on the table. Mm -hmm. And some recent research says they might actually be a lot younger because in every farm there might be three to four people part-time farming. Yeah. And they're all farmers, if, except the father, you know, the, the land is in the father's name and he's the head of the household, but he's not the only farmer there. So. Your question is pressing because they're already farming and they don't want to be farming and they're not making enough money farming. So um, a framework is important. And here I think um, I really have to spotlight the government because um, we need transformation at that level. So we've got to think about agriculture, young people, our economy um, as part of the transformation agenda for the country. Uh -huh. And uh, understand that you know it's, it's, it's interlinked. So if we grow and if we're productive, there'll be more decent jobs. If people are productive, there'll be more growth. So we need to tackle both together. And the government needs to really put in place two aspects. One, some infrastructure support. Yes. Because at the moment, even what we're producing between urban and rural is not reaching, is not 
being consumed, there's a lot of waste. Yes. So how do we reduce post-harvest losses? How can we create more pathways? Which, which runs to almost 25%. Eh? Exactly, exactly. So that's just, it's obscene, O'Brien. Like that kind of waste. So, and with some infrastructure investments, if we can plug that, mm -hmm. that would be amazing. And it becomes public investment. It's a job of government and then private sector and others. You know, if they incentivize and invite, then all of us are also duty bound to come in and, and support that. But we need that sort of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. In addition- And what kind of infrastructure would you be looking at? So um, supply chain improvements, warehousing, timely transport, mm -hmm. then sort of on, uh, on the finance side, what we're seeing is farmers today need more knowledge, right? But on the back of the knowledge, they need to have enabled access. So if we think, even if we take fertilizer, which is a sector that I belong to and I'm, I'm part of right now, um, how can they access affordably? With climate change, you take a loan, and if there's no forgiving mechanisms, and one season is flat, either because of the weather or other issues, they're not able to pay back, they're back in poverty. So we need infrastructure, physical, around you know, sort of post-harvest losses, supply chain, transport. Then on the other side, we need infrastructure around knowledge, finance, you know, new models that can help people access money to be able to run agribusinesses, but also to invest in their farms and create more jobs. So all of this needs to be part of the government's economic transformation agenda. Mm -hmm. So it really comes back to that, right? Um, and then, of course, there's another whole conversation around skills to be had. Mm -hmm. So the framework needs to be policy changes, highlighting economic transformation, infrastructure support, and then some policy that's related to youth and women, because we need to incentivize them. And that we get into a tricky area, right, around land reform. How do we allow and encourage more women to participate? Mm -hmm. So we need some reform there too. And what incentives do we give young people to bite the bullet, take the risks, and get involved more in agriculture? So incentives on the policy side on, and those softer areas are also very important. And, and what is the role of uh, the, uh, the private sector? I think um, significant. Um, big private sector worldwide is a massive creator of jobs. It's it's what we do. We you know, contribute to productivity and we create jobs. But to be able to do that, there needs to be an enabling environment. You, know, you need very, very strong invitation from government to be able to do that. And if private sector wants to come in and do that, the infrastructure I talked to you about, public investments need to come in as well. So then I think the two play together to solve the problem. Um, so the role of the private sector will be to invest more, mm -hmm. if the en enabling environment is strong enough and welcoming enough for us to do that. Um, it is then to create those jobs. But what I'm seeing um, in Kenya is, even within the jobs available, there is an issue with matching. So that goes beyond your question on framework. But if we can match private sector need to availability of skills, so young people in rural areas don't know really what jobs are available, which fit the skills they have. Employers are searching. So those sort of things also, like an information exchange by government, these could all be very interesting ideas, but private sector's job is to create jobs. Mm -hmm. But we need the enabling environment to be able to do that. I mean, if you just walk to, into any, 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 any high school or secondary school and you take 10 people, 10 young people, and ask them what they would want to be when they, when they finally venture into career. Uh, hardly are you likely to hear anybody telling you that I would want to be a farmer. And because for the longest time, you know, farming has been associated with poverty, uh, with misery, with, with, with pain, with losses. And, and so, so how do we change that narrative? How do we make young people to be part of the agriculture conversation? Yeah. Another great question. So I think uh, you're absolutely right. If one in ten said, I want to follow my father or mother's footsteps and go back on the farm, I would be amazed. Because today it is, that is the perception of farming and, and justifiably so. It's been about low income. It's been full of risk. Mm -hmm. That's been the reality of, of farming in, in most Asian and African countries, right? So that, 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 that is the fact. So to change that perception, we need to change the facts. Right? Like, so we need this enabling environment because we must be able to encourage them on the back of a truth. 
So if we say that, look, you have vocational training opportunities, you have these kind of skilling you can do, these agribusiness you can get involved in, I find farmers are very smart, the children even smarter. Mm -hmm. So therefore, opportuni you know, to sniff opportunity is not difficult, but we need to create those opportunities. That said, there is also a social perception and so you're absolutely right, right? On the social perception side, um, we need to start in school. We need to start in school and parallel in the community to build a different image for farming, right? To say, this might have been your grandfather's and father's profession, but it can be very cool for you. It can make money for you. It can bring prosperity for you, right? And I'm, I'm seeing now some urban sort of, you know, college educated people going back and really talking about, um, we had this event last week and we had young farmers are saying, I'm, you know, the next billionaire is going to come from agriculture. Mm -hmm. So to find these kind of role models coming out of studying agriculture degrees at the University of Nairobi and things and to use those kind of influencers and role models to go back to rural areas, to schools, to encourage youth, this is one level of social perception. The other is education programs in schools that really bring that awareness to say, you know, feeding your country, producing, these are thing, things to take pride in. And the third, but most important, is that there's money to be made in it. And this is how you can make it. There's money. There's money to be made. And so we, we need to be able to pass that message and then show the way as to how that could be done, which is where agribusinesses, small businesses, these things become very interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and you see, when you look at, um, you know, agriculture in Kenya, I mean, 70% of it is practiced by or what we call subsistence farming, mm -hmm. um, which is susceptible to huge losses, especially when... Um, when uh, th 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 there is um, lack of rains, you know, there is uh, lack of proper infrastructure, there is lack of market. And, and, and so with that in mind, uh, how then do we upgrade our farming, you know, to get to a level whereby now we can say now this is agriculture on a business model? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think um, you're absolutely right, right? Uh, the toughest part of this problem is the problem of subsistence farmers. And as generations come and families split, land holding is becoming even smaller. Yeah. So we have to crack the productivity problem, right? We have to increase land productivity. And to be able to increase land productivity, we have to help our agricultural community organize itself for scale. So the cooperative model in Kenya is extremely successful. Mm -hmm. And that's a fantastic example to draw from, that you can own your land, but you can aggregate and belong to a community and together you achieve scale, right? And then that community has the power and the agency to source knowledge, access inputs, all these sorts of things that, that make it viable. So I think uh, there are smallholders and then within smallholder subsistence, right? Even if we tackle the smallholders first, that, that population itself out of this subsistence is, is quite a lot. What I call sort of the top of that cup and move them into some forms of organizing, self-organizing, consolidation, I think that could be one way of getting them to be viable economically and to scale. Um, here we have good policies and good support in, in Kenya. And I think we just need to do more of that. Like we need a cooperative bank 10 times the size of the co-op bank. Mm -hmm. They're one of our partners, right? And we need models of cooperative organizing for different crops. And, and for smallholder crops like maize, right? Mm -hmm. Like right now we have a lot of it for where there's money, there's better organizing. So coffee, tea, those sort of cash crops. Yeah. We need to do it more for subsistence crops like, like maize. Like maize. And let, let's, for example, take maize. Um, and let's take, for example, um, you know, a bag of maize and, and look at, uh, you, you know, the cost of producing one, 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 one bag of maize, uh, whereby uh, almost uh, uh, 35 to 48 percent will go into farm input. Uh, then uh, about 20 percent will go into transport and logistics. And then uh, you have middlemen along the process who take uh, between 10 and 15 percent. And so at the end of it all, the farmer who did the donkey work ends up with about 10, 12 percent profit margins. So how do you flip the coin and ensure that the farmer, who is actually the, bi the biggest uh, 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 player in this supply chain, you know, gets home with the most? Yeah, yeah. Tough question. Um, and particularly in the context of maize, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's so true because Supply chains don't organize themselves. Um, pricing 
is, is what it is. It's, it, it's sort of really influenced by the market. Yeah. And then also the regional market, right? So it's, this, is, this is a tough one. I think with, uh, with maize, it's the, we need to look at it first as if you are, how do we enable farmers to keep cultivating mm -hmm. and produce maximum? So if you have a hectare of land, that you are reaping the most you can from that land mm -hmm. in terms of production. Because that ensures two things. One is first and foremost food security for the immediate family and that community. And then whatever is left is the excess you want to be able to sell. Realizing value for the excess, I think, again, uh, government can really help here with commodity exchanges, the ability for the farmer to be able to sell directly. At the moment, they are so uh, dependent on who comes to buy at the farm gate, mm -hmm. right? Exactly to the middleman point. Private sector by itself, we've been working on this for a while, right? Yep. Private sector by ourselves are not able to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. We need some government intervention, particularly in staple crops, to be able to say this will be the procurement. These are the rules of procurement, mm -hmm. not to interfere with free market, but at least to put down some, some rules of procurement. Yep. There's a grain council that is, that is helping, that's helping a lot. Um, but to your point, it isn't, it isn't enough. So maize is a complex problem, it's, it's quite nuanced. But uh, my, my view on this is that I think from the private sector side, we need to be able to bring more knowledge and create solutions and models that enable them to increase their productivity so they have more volume to play with. You consume, so even if it's at a 12% margin, you're selling more. At the moment, there's not even enough to sell to make money beyond your own consumption. Mm -hmm. Often that's the problem. So I think we can contribute on the productivity side with knowledge and solutions. And I think government can contribute with really trying to see how they can not regulate procurement so much as guide it, right? So that farmers have more discovery without middlemen, because that's, that's a big part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So margins are made there. What lessons can we draw from India? I mean, wh where you're from and look, I mean, with a population of almost 1.4 billion people, you know, that's a significant number of people. Um, and the onus is on the government to ensure that there are proper regulations, there are proper framework, the right infrastructure in place to ensure that these people are well fed. So what has been done in your country to ensure this is successful and what can be borrowed and implemented here in Kenya? Yeah. So um, for, for the government of India, successive governments, not just one, uh, food security and self-reliance has been top of the agenda. Right, so over the last 30 years, that's exactly what they've achieved uh -huh. on the back of the Green Revolution. Yeah. It comes with other problems today and our soil is in such terrible condition. But in terms of feeding the country, exactly the staggering billion plus, right? Um, the government has very, very good infrastructure. Part of it is what I referred to earlier about public investment in storage and warehousing, uh, procurement. So, uh, you know, products like wheat, which mm. are staples. Yeah. Um, there's a very, sort of well-organized system of public procurement, um, which then feeds um, you know, a system of rationing that reaches across the country. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a, from that angle, there is a food sort of security net in India. Um, it's working well for that size of population. Mm -hmm. I think Kenya is, um, it's such a vibrant economy, the government doesn't even need to be that bold, mm -hmm. right? It just needs to maybe come halfway towards a solution like that. Um, you have an educated population, uh, you, you know, you have a very smart population, you have a young population. Um, India has, has a mix. We also have a young population, it's a much bigger country, the diversity and challenges are many more. I think here the potential is so much, with half that government intervention and support, um, Kenya will go much further to solve its problems much quicker. Mm -hmm. I know as the Ara Africa, you know, you have launched a leadership academy, um, you know, whereby you want to upscale uh, uh, the knowledge of young people and especially when it comes to uh, management of small businesses and, and how they can venture into, into agribusiness. What are you telling them? So uh, maybe I'll, I'll take a step back and uh, just say why because it's in continuation of our conversation. Mm. Um, we, we really think that the jobs are going to be in the agriculture sector for at least another 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. right? we're, in the, we're, in the, we're in agriculture, so it's of interest to us, but the jobs are also going to be there. All the great aspirational jobs in the big city that young people want to, to create them at that scale will take more time. So that said, if the opportunity is here, <coughs> then how do we turn young people's attention to that? And then how do we equip them 
to be able to participate in that, right? So when, when we looked at that problem, we realized that um, if you look at the business sector, agri, agri business sector, there's about sort of um, seven sort of there's about seven million micro, small, and medium enterprises in uh, in Kenya. The the proportion of that <coughs> in agriculture is is not that many, mm -hmm. but it's sufficient enough to create more jobs, and that's something we can influence. So the Yara Leadership Academy was launched last Friday with that thinking to say, what can we do? <coughs> we must do everything we can do today. We see lots of young people who who have the capability in rural Kenya, who can do business, and with a little bit of support, they can really go far. So the Leadership Academy is a 12-week module. It will address um, a range of things. So um, the basics, like bookkeeping, accounting, how do you sell, how do you negotiate? But it will also do one thing which will be a big differentiator, and that will be how do you build a growth strategy to, to really think about if you think about a small <coughs> shop in a village, don't think that. Think that you could make that bigger. You could serve a bunch of villages, that you could have a branch. So how should they think about growth? So this program will focus on training them for that and also giving them enough information to know where can they go for capital. And, and who qualifies right. for these uh, training? Who will apply? Yeah, who yeah. qualifies? Who qualifies? So uh, to start with, in 2012, so our, um, our ambition in the next couple of years is to really train 3,500 micro, small, medium enterprises. In 2022, yeah. um, the target is 500. And uh, we always say, you know, sort of change has to start at home first. So we're inviting everybody in our channel, anybody in our stakeholder group who might be selling Yara products, who might be tra you know, sort of tr trading in those in some way, who might be using them, who might have a business, but be interested in doing this. So really our channel first, and uh, focusing on young people and women in our channel to say, apply. Um, and the applications opened last Friday. They will go through the 15th <coughs> of July. And we hope to, we hope to get about 1,000 applications yeah. and select 500. Very good. And so we need to come back to the studio and wind up on our interview. We have been talking about how to encourage more young people to join agriculture. And of course, um, we've been having this conversation uh, with Subhashini Chandran, the vice president of, uh, of uh, or the vice president social impact at Yara Africa. Uh, before I let you go, um, you, we were talking about, um, you know, the Yara Leadership Academy that was launched on Friday, you know, targeting SMEs and young people. Um, how has been the response yet? Fantastic. So um, we're just under a week since the launch, O'Brien, and we have um, already nearly 250 applicants. Mm -hmm. We expect to go into the weekend with 400. And by the time we reach the closing date, which would be the 15th of July, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. our, our hope and wish is that we'll at least have 1,000 and we'll be able to pass this opportunity on to 50% of them because this year the seats will be 500. Mm -hmm. So fantastic. And the young people applying, we're encouraging more women. We haven't really done the analysis of, <coughs> of the applications yet. Mm -hmm. So what are you training them on? Um, a wide range of things. It'll be a 12-week module. And um, in a way, the first of its kind, because it brings very high quality education. And you only need to have completed secondary school, most likely, to be able to participate. But if you're a graduate, that's OK, too. So it will do the basics of um, business skills, bookkeeping, and all those sort of things. But what will be unique about this is we'll go a step further. Um, we'll teach um, negotiation. It will also be growth strategies. So even if you have a small shop or that's your thinking at the moment, you can begin to have the vision of how much more you can do. So that'll be, that'll be unique in this. And it will be free of charge? Completely, completely covered. If you make it, everything's fully paid for. It will be digital. Um, so those are some of the other unique pieces. And in addition to the digitally delivered program, there will also be personal coaching and mentoring. So a very, very high caliber program mm -hmm. um, delivered at your doorstep, on your mobile phone, and with coaching and mentoring over 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you expect of um, uh, those people who will be taken through this training? What, what do you expect with, uh, um, of them once the, 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 the training is done? I want to be able to come back here six months after that and tell you their businesses grew at least 20%. Mm -hmm. That's what we're after. And if each of them can create one job more, that's 500 more jobs within 12 months. So mm -hmm. that's what we're chasing, <coughs> mm -hmm. a minimum. As Ziara, I mean, you're, you're into the agriculture value chain. So what kind of um, 
agriculture knowledge will you be imparting on the participants? So product knowledge, because part of their portfolio will be products related to agriculture. So inputs, crop protection, not necessarily just our own, right? So through partnerships, we'll also bring that. Their ability to be able to raise farmer awareness on the importance of using things like fertilizer, but also how much of it and how much bang can you get for your bob, you know? So really that's that sort of training. So they become closer to the farmer because ultimately we are deeply concerned about the farmer. Mm -hmm. So by doing this, we build young people in businesses, but what we also do is serve the farmer better. So that's what we're hoping, knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, you know, training is open to anyone as long as you, you, you've graduated from high school? Um, yes, and if you are somewhere in our channel. So in 2022, we're limiting it to people who are either trading in Yara products, using Yara products, want to do business in agriculture and start having these portfolios in their shops. So that's the first. So there is a boundary around that. Mm -hmm. So Yara's extended community is the target pool for 2022 mm -hmm. across Kenya. Across Kenya. Across Kenya. If you're an agrovet, if you're trading, you have traded, you want to trade, you can apply. If, um, if you're a woman or a young person, male or female, we will prioritize because we also are chasing some targets around that. We mm -hmm. want to enable them more. Mm -hmm. And how much are you spending on this project? So 2022, the investment in <coughs> Kenya in the Yara Leadership Academy, setting it up, the program itself, all of that will be a million dollars. So about, about 118, yeah, 17 well, billion shillings. Yes, I yes, mean million, million yes, yeah? yes. Oh, fantastic. And, yes. and so um, finally, as I let you go, um, where do you see agriculture going um, when it comes to infusing young people's energy into this critical sector? Let me say where I hope it will go and where I think it must go. Um, it must go in the direction where young people think it's just uber cool to do it. There's mm -hmm. money to be made in it and it's a choice, not something they do because they don't have choices. That's where we need to go as a country and Kenya as an economy to be able to respond to the demand for jobs that are rising with young people. So that's where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe it will go in that direction. We're so hopeful the government will step up more. Uh, the private sector is doing more and we will continue to do more. Uh, because without a healthy, vibrant society, none of us can really exist. And that means we have to solve for young people in Kenya. Very good. So, Bashini, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning, of course, for helping us understand uh, the future of agriculture. It's been entirely my pleasure, O'Brien. Thank you for the opportunity. Asante sana. Well, Subhashini Chandran, uh, Chandran is the Vice President of Social Impact at Yara Africa, joining us here to understand the role of young people in agribusiness as well as um, getting a, g giving us more information about uh, the Yara Leadership Academy. You have been watching Bischek Lamb Broadcasting House. Remember, Tamarini is coming up next with Timothy Kipnosu. My name is O'Brien Kimani. Have yourself a good afternoon.